there seems to be a lot of controversy surrounding the amount of money being spent on acquisitions by these streaming companies. Netflix has an $18 billion war chest to buy content. And some writers are arguing that they aren't receiving residuals, which juxtaposed against this acquisition budget, it brings a lot of attention to the issue. For instance, there is an actress who appeared on HBO's Insecure for five seasons who recently shared that she received less than $100 in residual checks from Netflix from her work on the show. Netflix bought the show after it stopped airing on HBO and put it on their platform. And uh, among 20 or so checks that she received, they all totaled to less than $100. The lowest one being like 85 cents, the highest one being maybe $31. And that sounds like a horror story. But I also think it's worth noting that Insecure isn't a current show on Netflix and was acquired after the fact. Therefore, it's very difficult to know how much viewership the show is currently receiving on the platform. And what that really does is raise questions about the impact of streaming on the entertainment industry. Before streaming, there were far fewer shows being produced and everyone watched TV at the same time. On CBS, NBC, 9 p.m. was 9 p.m. for everyone. And the business model that thrived there was, hey, we have a captured audience at 9 p.m. who want to watch our network and we want to get the best show that we can get. Maybe that's Friends, maybe that's The Cosby Show, maybe that's Seinfeld, whatever that show is, Law and Order, whatever these long-running shows are, is an indication that it draws viewership to that channel. And they get to sell that viewership to advertisers who will pay premium dollars for a certain time slot. And so before streaming, that meant that there was a premium on the content that was being made. That also meant that there was a restriction on the content that was being made. Streaming comes around and what streaming does is eliminate the timeline. And now nine o'clock is different for everyone. And that changes things fundamentally because their business model is not built around a single time slot, a premium show, and people watching and we can sell that time slot essentially to advertisers. They are essentially a Google Drive in the sky where people at will choose the content that they want to watch. Before streaming, there were probably somewhere around 200 and something productions per year by Hollywood. Let's just call it that group. With the rise of streaming in 2019, Netflix alone released 370 titles on their platform. There's a lot of argument to be made that streaming has somehow cheapened the entertainment industry. Others point out that it has also allowed for more content to be produced, including shows like Insecure, where someone argued that that would not have been made in pre-streaming era. Why am I saying this? I think the, that's the argument of the streamers, that we are not a broadcaster. We don't control what people watch. We are essentially a library in the sky. And I think they're going to try to use the argument, just as any writer, J.K. Rowling or John Grisham, does not go to any public library system and say, for every book that's checked out, you have to pay me. They don't have that business model. I think they're going to say the same thing. It's important to understand the business models that we're in right now. It has fundamentally changed. We want to compare streaming to broadcasting, but actually streaming is a lot like Blockbuster digitally. They're essentially Blockbuster and Sky, meaning the cloud in this instance. And in the Blockbuster model, actors also didn't get paid every time a movie was watched, where streamers are saying, we're not a broadcaster, we don't control what people watch. We're more like a Blockbuster where people walk in and they choose what they want to watch among all of the titles that we have. And if you go back to the Blockbuster model and saw how that operated, the risk was on Blockbuster. A movie's coming out and Blockbuster says, this is going to be a hot movie. I think a lot of people are going to rent this. I'm going to buy 20 titles of this DVD. And maybe each of these DVDs costs $100. I'm not going to put 20 of these titles in one of my stores. If I own 10 stores, I have to multiply that. This is a very unscalable solution. They would take the risk of buying all of this content and hope that they would make their money back and the number of rentals. And in that business model, no actors received residuals. And that's the argument the streamers are making. We are buying content. Before, in the broadcasting model, had a show like Insecure not been syndicated or not picked up in reruns, it would have just been off the air. And so Netflix is saying, we are paying to acquire this and we are taking the risk that people are going to watch it. The other part of that is, 
Think about the library of Netflix. There are 6,500 titles. And so then the new question becomes, of the 6,500 titles that are available on Netflix for customers to pick and choose at any given time to make 9 p.m. whatever they want it to be for them, what percentage or what share of the the titles do you believe this particular show is getting in any one month when it's not a current show, it's a show that's off the air from a different network and it's sitting in a library among 6,000 other titles? I think one of the real culprits to consider when we're talking about where the problem lies is that the issue is not so much the streaming company as it is just pure competition. You are competing for FOMO. What should I be watching now? I don't want to miss out. And nostalgia. For the first time ever, we have access to all content. I can watch your current stuff or stuff you did five, 10 years ago. And I think that that's important to consider when we're talking about why don't we have as much residuals as we had before. There's also just that much more competition to watch content currently. We're also talking about the societal shift to consuming large amounts of content generally, because it's not just streamers. If Facebook had never existed, I would not have to look at whole news feeds anywhere. It's insane, you know, the amount of the amount of content that people ask you to consume. But, you know, when you were talking, one of the things that you mentioned is this like $18 billion budget, like where does it go? So when I was at Netflix, you know, I got to, you know, see a lot of the products that were built to kind of help try to make the business more efficient. And one of those examples are trying to figure out how much a, a piece of content should actually cost. So instead of saying, oh, let's just buy this thing, your response should be some more like, oh, well, um, let's not spend over X for this thing, right? Like we could actually create, you know, a model that talked about how much, you know, based on the, the user behavior for other pieces of content like that, this is how much that thing should be worth. There's also tools that said, you know, if you wanted to cast an actor, like this actor might be worth this versus this other actor. In theory, you could look at someone who maybe has less of a, a high profile, but has a high potential for payoff because they're cheaper. There's so many different tools that talk about pieces of content and which piece of content actually return value versus other pieces of content. And I'm going to tell you, as someone who was on those teams trying to build things to help them make better decisions, many content executives just didn't, didn't even look at them. They didn't. They didn't look at them at all. They said at the end, it's about my gut. So so to the larger union conversation that I think is going on here, it's, well, what the heck are you doing? Right. Like, you know, maybe you need to be more efficient with the 18 billion dollars. And it's not about us losing money. It's about you figuring out how to be a better business. And I do think there's a responsibility there because it's a responsibility not only because it's the unions who are asking that. But it's, it's a responsibility in the companies, right? Because as a stockholder in some of these companies, and since I know exactly what happens, I think in my head, I'm like, I have this stock, but sometimes I'm really frustrated because I know they're probably not being nearly as efficient as they should be 